And now, on to our next session, The State of Producing. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our moderator and the president of the Producers Guild of America, as well as the owner of Homegrown Pictures and the producer of Hustle and Flow and Exhibiting Forgiveness, Stephanie Elaine. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. So happy to have you all here. Um, I've got a crazy great panel. Um, they switched the order, so I'm going to read. I'm just going to bring them up. You know who they are. If you don't, you shouldn't be here. Um, <laughs> let's start with Brad Simpson, partner at Color Force. <laughs> we have my girl, Lynette Howell Taylor, producer of A Star is Born and Blue Valentine, and the 2020 Oscars. Okay, Mike Fair, I've known almost as long as my children. Um, Mike is the executive producer of After Midnight, among many other things. Let's welcome Mike. And Tommy Oliver, founder and CEO of Confluential Films, too many films to name. Come on up here. Okay. The title of this panel is The State of Producing. But who knows the state of producing? I mean, we're not going to pontificate on trends or foreshadowing, any of that stuff. What you have here is the opportunity to uh, listen to some of the top producers talk about the changing times we're living in and how they navigate through it. Okay, So that's going to be the tenor of this conversation. Um, but first, I want to start by saying this is my second year as uh, president of the PGA, along with Donald DeLine. I've always been, thank you, I've always been a card-carrying member, but until I got into the weeds with this organization did I understand the power of advocacy, the power of education. People say, oh, what does the Producers Guild do for me? You don't know because you don't, you don't participate enough. Because if you did, you'd understand how many lives are changed. And um, so I'm just grateful to be here. I just want to shout out to the executives, to Susan and, 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 and Michelle, <laughs> Susie, Mike, and all the staff, by the way, who puts together this year round for you guys. So um, dig in because there's a lot here. Okay. Stephanie, I had a quick question. Yes. You said we can't pontificate on this panel? No. No pontificating. I, I, I don't know how to do a panel without pontificating. <laughs> so that okay. might be a little rusty. We learn everything, every new thing every day. OK. <laughs> Everybody's talking about the big contraction. The big contraction. Oh my god, it was so good before. Now it was so shitty. What's going on? How do you guys, in your own work, navigate this changing thing? Like, well, first of all, has it changed? Has it changed for you? Tommy, you're smiling. Without pontificating? <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah, it's changed. And there has been a very real contraction, both in mass, but also specifically for the, ty the types of things that I and we make. And so it's been hard to figure out how to find the opportunities right now and how to continue to make the stories that we can be proud of and figure out what it looks like and part of it comes down to a lot of it comes down to the to the economics of it where the economics of just two years ago are not the economics of today and when you're not willing to break a project or consider a different way of doing it but you're still trying to force it through then you're going to wind up at a place where it just doesn't work and so for me, it's been a, a process of just being ruthless in what that looks like, whether it's at my company and what our team looks like and the types of projects that we're doing or the budgets or the ways in which we're thinking about being creative about how we are putting money into something or not or just all of it. And so I think that, but it's always the case like with us. It's like it, it changes all the time. The, the models change, the business changes, and so I think it's our responsibility to be really close to the market, to the business, to understand the levers that we can pull and where there's, oh, there's a little crack right there. Let me get in right now. And so, yes, it's changed. 
I would also say that I've been doing panels for 20 years, and I don't think I've ever not been asked the same question, which is the business has changed. How do you handle that? I think that the business is always changing. It's been changing since the dawn of time, and I think our responsibility and everyone's responsibility as a producer, or if you're a writer or a director, is to figure out, okay, so what does it currently look like and how do I navigate that? But for me personally, I think that what always remains at the center is, um, is that great stories find a way to rise to the top and great material finds a way to rise and it's just about distribution outlets changing. And, um, but the way that I've been producing is, has been the same. It's just about navigating different people and, and, um, and different ways to find audiences um, and different ways to raise money for the movies or the TV shows that you want to make. Um, but at the center of it, always for me, is if you have a great piece of material to start with, then that's the foundation um, to build upon. Yeah, I mean, I had a, um, in 20, 2006, I had a meeting, and I was probably 33 then, um, with the head of the motion picture department at CAA, and she looked at me and she said, how old are you? And I said, you know, I'm 33. And she looked at me and she said, oh, you missed it. You missed it. And I was like, well, and I just arrived in Hollywood from New York, and I was like, wait, no, what did I miss? She was like, oh, the, the first dollar gross, the big deals, everything, it's over. And, um, and it was real de really depressing. Um, but, um, and it was true to an extent. Like, I hadn't missed that moment. There's this sort of golden period for um, producers in the 1990s where all the studios had producer pods, where producing was really valued. And, and I agree with you that, that we've been doing the same thing. It's, it's, you're always sort of pushing through. But I think what has changed is I've watched the devaluing of producing amongst financiers and executives. And I think it's what the PGA is doing is important because I feel like there's been this decision that you know producers aren't as important as they used to be. And they're critical. I think they are critical and they're vital to making something better. And one of the things that's happened over the last six years that's been you know, insane is the idea of uncoupling your financial incentives from how well a movie or a TV show does. And this was known as like the buyout, where you know they would give you, if you did a streaming movie, they would give you all your money up front. And so it's great if your movie's a flop, actually, because it means you probably get a little bit more than you would have gotten. But if, you're, if your movie does really well, then you don't share in the upside. It's no longer an annuity for producers. If you sort of hit and do really well, you'll participate in that success forever. And what's also happened is it's incentivized producers to not focus on quality, but focus on quantity. And I think that, you know, there's been a pushback, but, you know, you need a producer there to make sure something is better. I'll, you know, conclude this part by just saying I was having a meeting with the studio recently and, you know, they had some successes in the last year and they'd had some failures. And this is a studio that's gotten rid of all their producing deals almost entirely. They've cut out all the producing deals. And they said to me with all seriousness, we've realized something. Um, and we've realized if we work with better filmmakers, we think the movies might be better and then they might do better. And they said this not with any irony, but with complete, like they'd crack some code. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would just say, just if you're one of those producers that was fortunate enough to be a part of one of those buyouts, I think we all had that feeling like, oh, this is too good to be true. Something feels off about this. We took the money, but it uh, wasn't ideal, obviously, in the long run. And, and for me personally, I primarily work in comedy. I'm just curious, like, for, with a round of applause, how many people are focused on comedy in here? So probably 12%. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and God bless Hacks, right? Hacks is one of the few, like, uh, I wouldn't say great, but it, it's probably the most high-profile comedy comedy, right? Nothing against the bear, but the bear is a very different show than Hacks. And so how do we cope with it? Like, with writers, you complain, because no one does complaining better than, than comedy writers. <laughs> Uh, and, and then with producers, you know, it's incumbent on us to just keep pushing the envelope and pushing people to, to make choices that do celebrate risk taking and, and, and betting on creative talent. Without creative talent, we, we can't pontificate. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I think uh, in comedy, the bar has never been higher 
to get things made, and that's primarily because of the rise of TikTok, and there's so much free comedy, and just people can just tune in and, and catch like 30 seconds or three minutes or whatever it is, and they kind of get their fix. And stand-up. Stand-up has never been bigger, which is fantastic, but it's had a real impact on the amount of scripted comedy, television, and film. But I think that's also true in general with, with audience. With audiences where today you can go to TikTok, you can go to YouTube, you can go to these things that it doesn't have to cost $20 million or $10 million. It can cost $20 and it can have somebody's attention for hours. And so when that paradigm has changed and the way that people value their time is different, then we have to consider what that looks like downstream. It's just hard. It's, it's very hard. <laughs> it's all hard. I think we should acknowledge that everything we're talking about is really hard to do. And this, really hard. In this moment, it's sucks. really hard. It's really hard for these guys who are very successful. So I'm just, just, just to weed out the diehards, like you have to be in it to win it. You have to stick it out to get to the end, right? So um, producing is the kind of um, calling. I think um, the other day we had our, our PGA cohort uh, create, PGA create this, yeah, hey, hey, all of you guys. And some smart young woman said, well, what do you guys do for a day job? <laughs> and I thought that was really interesting because you can produce anytime, anywhere. Like you can produce in front of the TV when you're thinking about your movie and you you pull up your computer and you say, God, that, that's how we're going to crack that. You can, you can do it any time, but you do have to make money and live, right? So um, this is a segue because I think it might be valuable to some people in the audience. But like as you were coming up, did you have to, yes, they did, do anything else besides produce? Like, like what, is the, what is the day job that can sustain a producing career? And by the way, you know, several years ago, I was like, shit, it's hard. What am I going to do? And I ended up producing, uh, directing the LA Film Festival. It was like, oh, this is another skill I can, I can hone, right? That live action producing led to Lynette calling me and asking me if I wanted to produce the Oscars with her. Hell yeah. <laughs> so we always have to pivot. And I think that is part of this conversation. Like, how do you su sustain a life? while you're pursuing this thing that out of all the other professions is amorphous. It's what you make it. It's at this point undervalued, but we've heard before it has been valued and I believe we can restore the value to this profession. Um, thank you, we, we, we must. And one of, the things, one of the things that I think is critical is why are producers the only artist on a line item budget that doesn't have health care. What's up with that? That that that's not just wrong. That's really wrong. So one of the things that the the guild did, and you know, we've been talking about this for a long time, is to encourage all the production companies and all the studios to honor the uh, MPI insurance that is in place with certain caveats for certain productions for all of the studios that are members of the AMPTP. That's number one, because they try to get away with it. <laughs> they try to get away with not doing it. So letting your agents know, letting your reps know that that is an option that you should pursue. The second thing is a lot of people have um, coverage from unions, you know, um, production managers, um, you know, uh, from the DGA, from other things, from Yahtzee, they're covered. But for the true creative producer, what the Guild has done is to implement this initiative, we call it the PGA Healthcare Initiative, and the idea is to normalize, to standardize a line item on the budgets for producers who are not covered by other insurance. This we announced at our big event earlier this year at the Producers Guild Awards, um, and we had four amazing companies that started it, but since then, the response has been overwhelming from production companies who want to support producers. So in, in a little while, we're going to announce all the other people that have signed up, and, um, and we are going to keep going on this so that when you make a budget, you will create a line item for producers' health care. Full stop. So that's what we're doing. 
So I want to ask you guys, what, how do you manage healthcare on your films? Like, I know that we're, we're, we're part of this change that we're making. So is this an issue? Is this something that you guys think about? What do you do on your sets? I mean, it, it is a huge issue. I mean, we're, at our company, you know, we're lucky enough to have an old system, which is a, an overhead deal. So we're able to provide, you know, we've consistently had that. And when Nina and I have not had an overhead deal, we've self-financed the company so that the producers who work for us are all sort of under a constant healthcare plan. Okay, but I, I'm not saying that is a, I mean, we're just, we're fortunate enough that we are still have remnants of the old system where we have had pod deals. And so, um, and so the producers who work for us participate in that system. I think what the PGA is doing is great. And I know there's other uh, initiatives going on to try to find for the, for the people who are in that position where they can't get union health care, but they're, you know, but they're not part of a company. How do they get that? We haven't faced that as much just because, um, because we're lucky enough to have the old fashioned deals, but we've actually been meeting with the studios recently as part of is, alongside the producers, Guild producers United has been making a push with the studios to, um, to put that line item in the budget to make sure, cause it's like what $30,000 on a, you know, I mean, how much would they have to spend? It's a small amount of a bigger budget to provide healthcare for the small number of people who don't qualify under a union. It's really the PAs and the producers are the ones who, um, and, and you'll see producers who theoretically are in charge of, you know, are the bosses of the entire crew. And, you know, they're having to struggle to make healthcare payments on their own. Um, you know, there's a thing, it's like, how do you know that you're the lead producer on a movie? And the answer is always, you're the one whose fee gets cut. Um, you're the one who may not have healthcare. I think that's always the answer. We, um, I, we, we provide um, my company, my own company, and we, I provide healthcare for my staff. It's my own. It's my own plan and my own policy. Um, but, you know, Netflix does do um, health care, but you have to ask for it. And so one of the things that we've been trying to achieve is, you know, it being automatic. Like, you know, I think it, it's, it is absurd that producers are the only, producers and PAs are the only people on a, on a movie that don't have health care. And so um, if you have movies at Netflix, you can ask for it. Um, and we have been told that you will get it. And it should not be something that you have to negotiate anymore. It's just something that they do. And we're trying to get all the streamers um, and all the studios to adopt the same policy um, because it's it's crucial. Um, and I think, um, you know, sort of also going back to like the sustainability question um, because it's related, you know, producers spend an extraordinary amount of time working for free. Um, you know, a big part of producing is development and um, and whether you're developing with a writer um, that's some, you know a, a script that's not set up somewhere, or whether you've actually been hired by a production company or a studio to develop something, um, you can still spend years um, working, signing a certificate that means that that studio or streamer owns everything that you contribute without getting paid anything, um, which is kind of madness, um, you know. And so, I think for me, like over the years, I've made all kinds of movies. Um, sometimes I've made movies that I wasn't thrilled to make, but I had to pay rent. You know, I mean, I, I, um, my, I don't come from wealthy parents, and so I've always had to support myself. I've had all sorts of jobs. I've had to raise money, start companies to have somebody finance me and pay me a salary. I've never been able to just, um, you know, sort of skate by. It's, it's, it's always been, uh, it's always been um, a profession that I've had to work really, really hard at. And, you know, there are movie, some years where I made five movies in a year just because I, I had to, um, and they weren't all great. Um, you know, it'd be nice to just have the luxury to kind of pick and choose, but that's just not the reality of what we do. Um, you know, so I think, I think sustainability for producing um, is a, it's a real challenge for everybody, and it continues to be a challenge. It's still a challenge for me every year, I think, about how I'm gonna cut costs and how I'm gonna save money and how I'm gonna continue to spend time developing and how much bandwidth I have and that my staff has, um, especially in the development phase where you're not getting compensated for it. Since we're on this conversation, um, can we segue to discussing how to protect producer credits? Because this is another issue that has gotten completely out of control. Um, you know, somebody's dog walker gets it now. I don't know. Um, 
but Lynette, as part of the academy, I think where a lot of us are in the academy, uh, Lynette's a governor in our branch, in the producer's branch, and she's been so active the last few years. Um, and uh, she and her team came up with a great, great start at this. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think what people forget, and, and this is really amped up in the last um, many years, is that, you know, producing, um, the title producer, it has um, it has privileges and responsibility. You know, it really it really does. And um, and what's happened recently is that agents and lawyers have used it more as a negotiating tool on behalf of clients because they want the um, they want the privilege part, they want the fun part, they want to be able to creatively um, you know contribute, but not necessarily wanting the responsibility. Or um, it's just become something that is negotiated. I mean, every time I get a phone call, I can attach an actor to something and their agent says to me, well, they want to they want to produce a credit. And I'm like, okay, but are they going to be doing producing? Are they actually going to, are they going to come to set when they're not on the call sheet? Are they going to come on scouts? Are they going to be financially responsible for the movie? Um, and most of the time the answer is no. And so I think what's challenging about the credit is that it really should be for a job performed. And that, um, and that if you want, and that if you're going to say, I want to be a producer, you have to be really willing to know what that means. And it means soup to nuts, showing up and being there and doing the work. And, um, and, and you can be a, a hyphenate, you can be a writer, director, actor, um, and still be a producer. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, that, that doesn't mean that you can't be a producer, but you also have to do the producing work. Um, so one of the things that we did at the Academy is, um, uh, because a lot of the times the credit is about awards recognition, and um, a lot of times people want the credit because they want to be, um, you know, when when the movie gets nominated for Best Picture, they want to be able to stand up there and accept an Oscar. And a lot of this, um, in terms of financiers, this um, the degradation of the credit started like really early with independent financiers. And so what we did at the Academy is, um, if you're a distributor of a movie. Um, and your movie gets Best Picture, um, that distributor receives an Oscar statuette. Um, and so we uh, just put in place a, um, a statue for independent financiers and studios of movies. And so if your movie uh, is nominated for an Academy Award and it wins Best Picture, the studio who financed over 50% of the equity or was the um, responsible party for delivering the movie, as long as you are an your the um, the company has no non PGA mark producers, so you can have the executive producers, or you can have a PGA mark producer that worked on the movie. Um, you are entitled to request an Oscar statuette from the Academy. So then you'll be represented, and you can, you know, have it in your in your office. And um, uh, but the great thing about it is that it's it sort of encourages and recognizes those individuals, especially on the independent side, that take a chance, that take a risk on financing independent work, um, and then often get shut out if they're not, um, if they don't get the PGA mark, and they're not, they take a producer credit, but they get shut out. What this does is it says, okay, take the executive producer credit instead, because that's really the role that you're doing. And when you get, um, and if you win Best Picture, you as the executive producer and the person that took the risk will also receive an Oscar. And I think it's like a really big deal for the independent financing world. Um, and I think, so just for anybody, like spread the word. Um, and if you're putting your movies together independently, make sure that, um, that your financier knows about this clause. Um, because I do think it will have an impact. Yeah, they'll take an executive producer credit, not a producer credit, and they walk away with the Oscar if the thing wins. So it's a win-win for everybody. So yeah, please spread the word on that. Um, I wanna read something that I encountered on a deal with just this week when somebody was asking for a producer credit. Please. I said, a confluential producer credits are reserved for and only afforded to those rendering full-time, meaningful, in-person and first position producer services, inclusive of acceptance of risk, guilt liabilities, and the like from prep through release. <laughs> and what'd they say? Thank you, no? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, we know what it is. It's like everybody tries to grab at it, but they don't want the actual responsibility or want to be accountable. And so unless you're gonna do that, then no, it doesn't work. If you're putting together something that's an independent film, you know how long the life of those projects, like how long it goes on when you're dealing with the, the corporation, the taxes and all of it, oh, you're gone after production. You didn't even get to, to post or delivery or anything else. And so for us, no, we don't do it.
Yeah, I think it's important for this room to remember that, you, you know, there are moments when a, a movie or a project gets greenlit, and so often that's because an actor says yes. But the reason for a movie getting made is definitively different than the role of a producer. And you have to really work hard to bifurcate those things and make choices like Tommy just did to like stand up for the role of producing. And when you're in a position of power, which is which producers are in a position of power, it doesn't always feel that way, but there are moments. Uh, you, you can choose to create these win-wins for the entire crew and the entire culture of a project, and that goes to healthcare and, and a million other things. But it actually erodes the culture to give a producing credit to someone who is not showing Thank up. Thank you. That is really important. And you know what? Part of, part of what this whole thing is is a community, a collective, the hive mind, we all have to think this way because that way it normalizes, it standardizes what we're all saying the same thing, right? Yeah, you just I, gotta I, keep saying it and then it becomes real, like I, Trump I, does. Yeah. Just... I, I, kinda, I kinda want Tommy to text that language to me and I'll just cross out <laughs> his, his company and then that, that will just become like the standard language. I want Tommy to tell us what actor was asking for the credit. <laughs> later <laughs> all of them all of them is the answer right okay but you know what this is not all doom and gloom guys life she told us we couldn't be depressing life that's one thing she said life is good all the time hey mike yes talk about how it's not doom and gloom <laughs> i tw so 20 years ago i worked for stephanie elaine i was her assistant <laughs> I learned so much from her. I he was I hard to do. train, I'll tell you. <laughs> Only Stephanie Elaine can pull off sunglasses inside at 10.30 <laughs> in the morning. God bless her. Um, it, it isn't doom and gloom we, we, we've talked about because th this moment, to your point, to both of your points, you, you guys referenced panels over the last 20 years and, and a meeting almost 20 years ago. It always feels like the world is about to end and, and the ceiling is about to crave. Uh, to. Cape. Cape, yes. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and, and so I think this moment presents very unique challenges that didn't exist in the past. And maybe the volume of change and disruption and consolidation is maybe a little bit heavier than past cycles. But these cycles have all existed. We don't have to like go through the litany of examples. If you are a student of Hollywood history, and, and we all should be to some degree, you, you, can, you can find those for yourself. Uh, but, uh, you know, in, in a moment like this, I, I just choose really hard to keep the best company. I, I just believe in this industry, like you are the company you keep. Uh, and, and that's something that we choose. Thank you, Stephanie. The only person who agrees. Um, <laughs> I learned that from Stephanie. She kept and continues to keep amazing company. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and W that really resonates what Lynette said about like I, I've had to make movies that you know I didn't love right and and that's that's a that's part of this journey and just just very quickly going back to when you're talking about like side hustles and things like that wh what I personally do is is think of my short time in this industry as like I'm the hub uh, of a wheel and there are multiple spokes that make up the entire wheel and I just try to play to my strengths in each one of those spokes and, and diversify what you're doing and, and the people that you're meeting and, and keep learning new things and challenging yourself. Take breaks and rest when, when you need to. I, I just finished working at a company called Funny or Die for 16 years and, and I loved it. Oh, thanks. Uh, but it was a grind, you know, like our, our entire core business of digital publishing no longer exists, was decimated by Facebook and YouTube and, and a million other things. And, and it was a grind. So now I'm actually taking time off and I'm fortunate to be able to do that. But that's like one of the spokes of my, my wheel right now. So as you guys are thinking through how to navigate that, I just think it, it for me, it's, it's easier not to think of this huge existential question and just get really pragmatic and intentional about how you're spending your time, the company you keep, and the sum of all those parts in time will lead to things that get made. Oh, that was nice. I'll, I'll also say one of the things that has happened, um, I think, in the last uh, year um, is uh, a real sense of the producing community kind of coming together because I think what happens when, um, when things become so terrible, um, and it really has been 
really challenging for producers. And, and the credit is part of it because you know, when you cannot define what the role is anymore, when you cannot define the job, how do you compensate fairly for the job? And so it has a very, has a real world impact. And so the fees um, associated with producing have sort of decreased. And it used to be that you would invest that time developing projects and you could do that and not get paid for it because then when the movie got made or the show got made, you knew that that line item in the budget, even though everyone's always trying to take it, it was reserved for you. And, and now it's not. Now you get to the starting line and there's suddenly eight people that are all asking for a producing credit and part of the fee that goes along with it. So your investment now, um, and that time you put in doesn't pay off in the same way. So it is kind of a crisis, but out of a crisis, there's always something that comes from it. And what I've really found is that producers more than ever are sharing information. Um, and there's a real honesty and transparency among the producing community right now about fees, about about credits, um, about healthcare. And, um, and there's so many, um, groups that are sort of trying to organize and mobilize to making a change. And I think that that's really positive. And what I would say to everybody here is talk to your producing friends, talk to your community and, and start building that community and share information um, because it's a very lonely, um, it's a very lonely career. Like producing can be very isolating. And even if you have a partner at your own company or you work with other producers on movies, um, it still can feel often quite lonely. And I've really found in the last year, having that community um, has really opened my eyes um, and given me confidence to be tougher in my negotiating. And, um, and, and so I would just encourage everybody to do that. And I do think that that's a positive that's come out of it. Can, uh, since you brought it up, let's talk about the power of partnership in terms of producing. I know at the beginning of my career, I was like, yeah, it's me and me alone is going to make this work. Um, and and there was a there was a, a sense of power in that, a sense of claiming your 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 identity and who you were and what you wanted to do. But as I've aged, um, I've learned how important it is to to partner with people you respect right, with people that you admire, with people that you want to have fun with, and it makes the whole process so much nicer. So can we, can we speak to that a little bit? I mean, you know, I, I'm part of a, I, I think, a pretty successful partnership, I mean, I mean personally, in that um, Nina Jacobson and I have been producing together since 2009, and we've been officially partnered since 2012. And, but that was sort of the way that I was raised. Um, I was Christine Vashon's assistant when she formed Killer Films, and she was my mentor, and she had a partner, Pam Koffler, and you know, I saw the strength in that partnership in that they absolutely trusted each other, and you have this thing where when you're a producer, there's always somebody mad at you. The studio's mad at you, the talent's mad at you, like you're, the, you're, this, you're, the, you're trying to protect the movie and the best version of the world, and so there's always some sort of pressure on the weekend. You, I remember when, when Nina, she'd been a studio executive and she, we were doing our first movie together and she was like, I used to go home on the weekends and I would be calm, but now I feel like all weekend there might be somebody out there who's trying to undo my movie and I have to protect it. And that's really the way you feel. But there is something about being able to leave set at the end of the day and look at somebody else and go, we're not crazy, right? Um, and then also somebody to just bitch about everybody with. Um, um, and, um, but I do think that like, you know, that if you can find, I think that there are some producers who are just more of what you were talking about, which is they're sort of iconoclasts. They have to be the one. One of the things that I realized, um, you know, early on is I liked having a partner. I liked having somebody where we could switch off going to set. And, um, and I do think, you know, look, by nature, there are some slippery producers out there, and there's a little hustle that every producer has, right? The sort of like, yeah, no, we've got the money, don't worry, like is, uh, is a thing you sometimes have to say. And so you're trying to make sure you're partnering with the person who's at least honest with you behind the scenes, no matter what you're saying to the people around you. But I think that, you know, from the start, I think identifying people that share your sensibility and share your taste and trying to work with them, I think that to Len's point, there's more power together and you can do more together is my experience. Stephanie, do you, re do you remember your three Ps? Of course. What are they? Well, I'll tell you, passion, persistence, patience. Thank you. Uh, so, three Ps. So uh, just as you asked us, I was just kind of thinking about three Cs because w with partnerships, if it's a bad partnership or someone who is not carrying their weight, 
it sucks. It's a waste of time. You end up worrying about, it's a total distraction. So you have to be really um, selective when you're taking on a partner. So as, you, as I was thinking about Stephanie's three Ps, I would say three Cs that come to mind are, are culture, chemistry, and complementary. You need someone who shares the same culture so that when you're, you're taking something on, it just feels seamless, your kind of point of view on the world. You need chemistry, you just need to get along. Like you gotta, these things take years and you're in the trenches, you, you kind of have to, it has to be a good hang. And then complimentary, you need someone who can do the things that you can't do well. Uh, we produced this movie called Weird, which is the, the fake biopic of Weird Al Yankovic. That, thank you to the 12% of comedy fans out there. Um, and there's a producer named Leah Booman at Tango, who maybe some of you guys know have worked with. She's amazing, and I will work with her, hopefully, for the rest of uh, our lives. And she was very complimentary to the skill set that I brought and others brought to it. So when you think about culture and chemistry and who can complement uh, your efforts, I think you'll put yourself in a better position to not, you know, team up with someone that dead weight just real is real weight. Look, I think it's the idea of if you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go together. And so many of the things that I've I've done or worked on, I've worked on with partners and whether it's doing something with my wife or doing something with companies or people who are willing to be in the trenches, where it's not somebody who's showing up once it's greenlit and just wanting to grab, but we're in it beforehand trying to build, knowing what it takes and being able to lean on each other, and we can do so much more because these things take a village. And so like for me, it's not about the idea of, oh, it's me, blah, blah. It's like, who cares? Who cares? I want to be the person who can be a good partner. I want to be the person who can be supportive. I want to be the person when there are things that come up because it always comes up, no matter what it is, whether it's creative or logistical or financial or whatever it is, it comes up. And so having somebody who is in there with you and who's also actually accountable and isn't going to be like, oh, yeah, I got to go, where you're looking at the clock, you're looking at whatever it is, but you know that that person's going to be there or people are going to be there, it is so much better and so much just more fulfilling of a process. I remember Kill, at Killer Films way back in the day, there was a movie we were producing and we had like a Hollywood star attachment who was helping us get financed. And we had a moment where, um, and I was in New York that uh, during that time and it was very gritty and, you know, um, and I, we had a moment where we weren't gonna be able to close the bond unless we got this very famous actor to, you know, sign a piece of paper. And it was a, one of those crazy situations where we had to close the bond that day or the financing fell apart and we weren't gonna make payroll and it was everything. And I called the producer who was nominally a producer with me who worked for him. And I was like, the whole movie's gonna fall apart. Like literally, if this doesn't get signed. And he was like, okay, well, I'm just in the middle of a lunch. So, um, uh, you know, when I get back to the off and we are in the, he asked, and I was like, no, you have to leave the lunch and do the thing. And he was like, Brad, I'm at a lunch with a very important agent. And that to me is like the op, the, what you're talking about, which is the like, and I remember thinking like, I'm sitting here in hell in this production office and he's at like Orso. And um, if that's a- But did he get it signed? Um, we did get it signed, but I don't think through him. I think we had to go through something else because he was like, I got to finish my lunch. Yeah, not because of him, in spite of him. And so it's just like those things don't work. And so it's like when you find those good partners, it makes it makes everything so much better. And also, not that it's for this, but there are so many people that I've worked with early in my career where it's come back later on. And I've been able to work with them again. Oh. And somebody who supported me, who were able to, I'm able to support them or be there when, oh, I'm in a lunch, but you need something, I can do it. So yes, I'm absolutely going to do that. I, to me, partnerships are the best. I mean, when you have a great producing partner, it's it's everything. I don't I don't like to walk through life alone. I don't like to walk through my job alone. I I, I want to do it with with someone else. I mean, you and I had the absolute greatest time doing the Oscars so together. Fun. And um, you know, and and um, you know, I've done a lot of stuff for the Academy, and so they asked me to do it. And and they would have been fine if I just did it on my own. And I was like, there's no way I want to do this by myself. This is like way too much pressure and way too much work. And you know, we didn't really know each other, you know, much before no, that. No, not at and, all. And and we became like wives. Like we spoke all day, every day. We so were talking fun. at three in we the morning. We were talking three in the morning. She'd be texting me. <laughs> and I'd be like, how about this idea? And, and, and I think, you know, that's just like one example. And I've had so many of them. But 
but it's so great when you can find that kind of joy. I mean, there's so many photos of you and I just like beaming because, and I think really because of each other, like you really made that experience for me. Um, and, and it just would not have been the same if I had done it by myself. It was, it was really, um, and so, and I feel like when you have that, um, when you have that relationship and you have those moments, it really makes the, it makes the joy so much more joyful and it makes the hard stuff so much easier to deal with. So true. So true. Thank Producing you. the Oscars is the bravest job in it's, Hollywood, I would also say. It, it's pretty like, badass, I know. have to say. Um, wait, I, I wanted to go back to something because I don't want to give these guys the wrong impression, which is some of you said, yeah, and you know, I just had to go out and make that movie. You know, I had to go do that thing. Is there a line, though? You know what I'm saying? Like, I have a line at my company, which is I don't do glorified violence. I just don't. You know, there's just there's too much of it out there. I don't want to contribute to that. So I will pass on things because of that. So, but we all got to eat. So the question is, do you have a line? You know, do you have a line? Because a lot of you said, oh, I had to go make that. I had to go back. Like, what is your line? I, I do, and my line is probably, I don't know, too high or too low, however you look at it, where I could have made a lot more movies. I could have done a lot more stuff, but there was stuff that just wasn't right, whether it was with the the wrong people or I didn't believe in it, and I could have made a lot more stuff. Maybe I should have. So it's a gut thing? It's a it's an integrity thing, which is something that I don't compromise on. And so the idea of working with shitty people or people who like it's it's real where you can have the best it. lawyers and you can think through every eventuality, but you know what's worth so much more than that? Knowing that my, my partner isn't trying to screw me or they're not going to try to because you can always get around stuff. And so at some point for me, it's just not worth it. Right. And so working with directors who are not good people where I've never been in prep or even really development where I've seen a yellow flag that has not turned into a red flag on set. You experience point. people's reputation. I mean, when when you're like, no, 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 this person has a terrible reputation, but like, I, I, it's been great so far. And then the moment mm -hmm. when it happens to you, <laughs> when they're suddenly, and you're, you're like, like, oh, right, right. this is what everybody right. said, and I'm not special. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I mean, there's a privilege to being able to. We try not to work with toxic people anymore, and part of that's just being older and I don't have the time, it's in it, protecting our crew and protecting people, but there's also a privilege to that because when you're scrambling to get a movie made and the only financier that's gonna do it has a sort of toxic head or there's some sort of, you know, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna say no to the money? It takes a lot to be able to say. Sometimes. No, and, and, but, I, but, it's, um, but as I'm saying, it's easier to me at this point in my well, career, so yes, I recognize For that. sure, it's easier for us yeah. now, but I remember, like there, there are lots of examples for, for me where I was making, my first studio movie and had a very tough time with the, the studio head. And there were a couple of things that I remember happening. One, I'm also a director and I'd made one indie film at that point and he offered me a, a $12 million movie that it was his movie that he could make happen. And we were talking about it and there was stuff that was just off and I passed on it. I passed on saying, on saying yes to this movie that I could have directed with the star attached because it was not right. And then throughout that process of making the movie, I realized that the idea that he had of me very much being his guy and making all sort of compromises so that we could make more movies in a compromised fashion was just a hard no for me. Where it's just like, I'm uninterested in that. And so at that point in my career, I'd made two indie films I had no idea what the next thing was going to be, but I still slept like a baby because I did the thing that I knew was right for me. And so I knew that would mean, yeah, I'm going to have to be more creative about wherever the next check is coming from or how I'm going to be able to pay for whatever else. But I also knew that I'm not looking at just the next three months. I'm looking toward the horizon. And so how do I build in a way that I can hopefully get there? And again, did it cost me? Probably. Because I could have had many more studio movies under my belt, but... If it wasn't what I wanted to actually do or in the way that I wanted to do it, then it wasn't worth it to me. I think also, especially in this moment, nothing is more important than your reputation. 
it almost like transcends like taste <laughs> and sensibility. It, 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 with things being this hard, if you're coming up and, and if your peers and kind of your community doesn't respond to you, you should work to change yourself because it becomes a very uh, small community. And, and it's not so true. And it's not hard to get anecdotes, good and bad, and in the middle about things, uh, about experiences. And so, um, you know, I, I just think uh, really take seriously how you treat people. Uh, it, you know, the golden rule works for a reason. I also feel like for me, um, if I, if I, especially like earlier on when I would like do some movies that I, you know, I was doing them because I wanted to learn more about visual effects or I, you know, I wanted to do something that was bigger. And, but if in my gut, I didn't think it was great. It never turned out to be great. You're like never wrong. It's like, if you know, it's not going to be great. It's not going to be great. And I think that, um, for me, my line now also is, um, if I don't, if I wouldn't want to watch it and if I wouldn't be excited about it, I won't do it. Um, and that's also because I, you know, producing is creative. It's like really creative. And I don't know how to give notes on a script that I don't like love and don't ultimately see the end goal for. I don't know how to build a movie for a director um, if I don't really understand the genre even. Like there's like certain genres that like I don't really dabble in because I'm, I'm not very good at it and I don't want to do stuff I'm not very good at. So I definitely have a line there um, for sure. I think the, the corollary to that though is that knowing why you say yes to something. And so it's not always because you think it's great. It may be because you want to learn something or you want to establish relationships or you want to work with somebody yeah. or you need the check. And That's like, exactly right. It's like those things are fine, but don't lie to yourself. Because if you forget that, then it's like, oh, no, no, this is a check and I need to pay rent. Yeah. And so it's like, I got to still show up and do it. Or it's like, oh, I really want to understand VFX. I've never made a movie like this. And it may not be the movie that's going to be great, but this will pay off three years from now, five years from that's now exactly when I'm right. making that movie. Or I'm a better producer when the director who's looking for somebody who has that experience where I can now show up in a better way. One of the things that I think is really challenging um, for me is I do have I do have a line in terms of people that I surround myself with, and especially finan financiers. You know, who it's sort of like who's going to be my boss on this movie, and that line isn't always the same as it is for the directors that I work with, um, because especially I've done a lot of first-time filmmakers um, movies, and so I've certainly been in positions recently where really hard to get somebody's movie made and then the option for financing it is somebody that I don't want to be in business with but that director that writer director is like desperate and they don't they're not experienced enough and they don't understand and it's like there's an offer here and I'm saying we shouldn't take it but then they don't get to get their movie made and that can be really tough to navigate I found that as I've gotten older because I when I was younger and I was I was sort of in line with them a little bit more like yeah we'll just take the money from anywhere we'll do whatever we have to and then you learn that that's going to be all pain um, and so that I find that to be more challenging as I've sort of like as my line has gotten a bit higher okay we're winding down here but and I still have two more questions so one of them is about the current challenges that we must address as producers with DEI. It's, this is like an old question, right? Like how do you navigate? Can you still say that, DEI now? DEI plus, plus? I don't I know. I mean, just the way that everything has been where it's no longer something that is seemingly valued. It's so 2020. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but did, did it happen in 2020? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess... It didn't happen. People talked about it. Oh, people, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. But what can we do, guys? I mean, we are the bosses. We make all the hires. You know, I was in a, a situation uh, where we really wanted to make sure that the folks represent on set represented you know the, the 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 demographic of the movie we're making or the world we live in or whatever and um you know we brought in a first it was a couple folks that were mm, not as qualified you know trying to give people a, a leg up we had to fire them we had to fire them you know what i mean and that's just keeping it really real where there's a there's a there's a couple different philosophies, which is how do you learn when you don't get the opportunity? How do you become good at something if you don't get the opportunity even to fail versus how do you protect your movie, you know, with the, uh, with the highest level 
but then you don't want to just have like an all white male crew. You know what I mean? Like, so, so how do you navigate this? This is something I've been, you know, working on since boys in the hood. You guys weren't even born then. Um, um, but, but I just think it's, it, you know, it's a big part of the mission of the PGA. You know, I told you our PGA Create Fellows are here. Like, we're trying to keep this 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 job, this calling sustainable to everybody. You know, it can't just be folks who have money and time to sit around and think about producing, right? It, it, it's, it's got to be available to all of us because we're the ones who are gonna tell all these unique different stories and help tell them. So, I don't know, do you have a plan in place? Is it to 2020? Should we just say, forget it, it doesn't matter? Like, what What the hell? I mean, that was obviously a joke, the to 2020, but, um, but um, I think the problem is, is that when you start at the moment where you're like, I'm hiring a crew, I would love to have a diverse crew, you're starting too late. Because, you know, at that point, you're going with your available options in the marketplace. And, you know, they haven't, there's, there hasn't been a system set up, right? You know, and I've seen this happen where, you know, people will feel really good about, um, uh, promoting somebody about being like, oh, well, we've got like a person of color who's like now head of the production design department on this show and the it's seven million dollars more an episode than their last show but we haven't given them the support to help them do this we've thrown them in and but we haven't given them more money we haven't accommodated for the fact that there's a learning curve and now oh they failed um but i think that there's there's this problem in hollywood which is hollywood doesn't recruit and there's this myth that you know you have to like to make it in hollywood you claw here and you you know you do everything and you struggle. And that is a lot of people's story. You know, when I came from Arkansas, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from privilege, but I still didn't, it wasn't part of it. Most people I know in Hollywood, they got it, they got a leg up because they knew somebody. They had a cousin, they had an uncle, they had some sort of way in. And it's crazy to me that the studios, that, that we as producers, you know, we've tried to do this more lately is, you know, going to colleges, going to universities, going out and trying to recruit people saying there is a pathway and then providing that pathway once you get here. When we were doing Pose in New York, it was amazing. I mean, this is something you've grappled with, I'm sure, a gazillion times. Like we had to find, you know, hair and makeup artists who could do the hair and the wigs of these black trans women. And it certainly wasn't the regular crew that we had there. And so we went to music videos and we got them into the union and then we had to do a training program to the demands of TV are just different. And I think that part of the problem is that people look at the moment that they're hiring and then they complain, well, there's no one to hire as opposed to what's the system way before then. Brilliant, thank you. That's the only answer we need from that. Now, in our last few minutes, I'm, did I tell you guys this? I, I need one thing really quickly. Wait, let me look it up. <laughs> Um, okay. It's a good build up though, stuff. Okay, I know. Okay, can you share one tip? What's your one tip? Oh, we didn't talk about personal life. I always like to talk about personal life <laughs> while you're producing, while you're coming up, fall in love, have some kids, like, I don't know, travel, become yourself, do some painting, you know what I mean? Like, like, like enjoy life. That's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> I, I hope that's the pull quote from the panel, do some painting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hope so, because I just did a movie called Exhibiting Forgiveness with Titus Kafar, which, which opened at Sundance, it's coming out in October. It's all about, it's all about forgiveness and, and painting. Um, okay, so what's your one, number one tip on how you survive, not how they can survive, but how you survive as a producer working today in our challenging, environment I, I didn't pr I didn't prep them they prepped for everything else you we've know. always developed and tried to make the things as Lynette said that we like and while we're cognizant of trends meaning I'm you don't sit there and not notice what the marketplace is doing we sort of focused on our taste knowing that it'll come back I remember when horror was like nobody wanted to do horror and now horror and you were sort of marginalized if you wanted to do horror films and now it's like you know the golden ticket for most people um uh that's the biggest thing and also and i would say to look at your career um as like a legend and as somebody who has just kept on it and shows that you could have a longevity producer is be willing to reinvent yourself over and over and over again oh madonna 
Okay. I, I, I've, I've like really diversified. Um, I produce theater, I produce Broadway, I, I do a lot of stuff um, with the Academy, I do television, um, I work across all genres, I do movies, um, and that to me has been what has sustained because I'm able to sort of hop around depending on you know which um, industry is is uh, is uh, is struggling the least and uh, and that's <laughs> that's how I've done it uh, two things come to mind one <clears throat> is gratitude uh, I still can't believe I get paid to do this Two, I mean a lot of producing is pontificating you get paid to basically express your opinion and work with talented people I'm I'm from Michigan. I, I didn't know anyone when I, I moved out here. Thank you for the two percent of people who are also from Michigan. So yeah, I, I how many comedy fans from Michigan in the <laughs> non-existent? Uh, there we go. There we go. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very. I still can't believe I get paid uh, to do it. And also just, you know, there's so much mystique and like build up to Hollywood, once you get in, you realize everyone, whether they're famous or a peer or anyone in between, we're all just people. Everyone's fucked up. Everyone's trying to manage. Everyone's trying to deal. Like, it's not that big of a deal. Like my mama said, be nice and wear a little makeup. <laughs> Take us home, Tommy. For me, it, it all goes back to, to people. And so wanting to, to work with good people, wanting to do things that we can be proud of, and when that's at the core of it, then you have to figure out how to make those things a reality. And so if it means studying a little harder, understanding where the marketplace is, understanding what's working, what doesn't work, great storytelling at the center of it, great people who are telling those stories, and not giving up because it wasn't easy 20 years ago. It wasn't easy 10 years ago. It's not easy now. We're going to be talking about the issues in five years. They're going to be different then. And so those things are going to continue to change. But when you know your, your why, like because this thing is hard as hell, and you are willing to do whatever it takes, then you're going to do whatever it takes and have some fun along the way. Be a good person. Just figure it the fuck out. Right on. I agree Thank with you. Stephanie, too, about have a life. Have Make a sure life. you have a life. Have a life outside, too. It'll you keep guys, you going. Tommy Oliver, Mike Farah, Lynette Hall-Taylor, and Brad Simpson. Thank you.